But we are, um, we're jumping a couple of chapters again this time. Um, this time actually going to Acts chapter 19 in our ongoing study through the book of Acts. Um, through as we, uh, as we just kind of grow and, and learn and discover exactly what does it mean to become viral. When we think about the church, when we think about our mission, when we think about the way in which, in which God has equipped us and where he has put us and, and how we are to minister, we got to think about, you know, what did it look like with the early church? How did the early church do it? How did they, how did they work through the process? Because they were, in many ways, they were just getting started. And if you remember early on, we were looking at it. At first, they were a pretty small group of roughly about 120, not too much bigger or about the same size as what we are here. But over time and pretty, pretty quickly and over a short time, they exploded through the work of the Holy Spirit, through the work of the gospel, through just simply by being and doing and doing certain things, the church just absolutely blew up. And by the time we get to the point we're at in our text, last week we started in, or actually, well, a couple weeks ago we started in looking at the, the ministry of Paul. And by the time we get to the text that we're at this morning, we're about 10 years now removed from when Jesus ascended. So, so far in 19 chapters, we've covered about 10 years of church history. And I just continue to point that out because there's this, there's this sense that, you know, we want to we hurry up and see results. You know, we live in a culture that's all about this instant gratification. We want to hurry up and see something. We want to hurry up and, and get something done. And it's hard for us sometimes to kind of sit back and think, you know, God, why are you not, why are you not making us bigger? I mean, we pray, we serve, we reach out, we come to church every Sunday, we do all these things, we have all these ministries. Why are we not just exploding? But when we look at the early church, what we realize is it took them 10 years now before they really started to become a real global movement. Granted, by this point, they've got a couple of thousand people around Jerusalem, but it takes time, it takes perseverance, it takes patience. Eventually, they got there. And as we're going through the book of Acts, it's kind of one of the themes that's sort of underlying there, one of the the strands that's sort of carrying through and playing through as a bit of encouragement for us. Perseverance, prayer, and uh, patience follows or reaps fruit. It takes a while, but we get there. So we're going to be jumping to the book, uh, we're going to be jumping to Acts chapter 19, and just kind of to fill in some gaps from where we were last time. We were in Acts chapter 17 last time, and after Athens, Paul made, after Acts 17, Paul made his way to the city of Corinth, which wasn't too far, a little ways north of, a little ways north of, of Athens. He makes his way to the, to the city of Corinth, and he actually spends about a year and a half in Corinth, and up until that time, that was the longest he had spent in any one place throughout the course of, of every, any of his missionary journeys up to that point. We're in Paul's second missionary journey right now. And he spends about a year and a half in Corinth. And after spending a year and a half in Corinth, he decides it's time for him to make his way back to Antioch, which has been kind of like home base for him. So we're all, that's where all of his missionary journeys have sort of launched from and where he set out. And he decides it's time for him to go back to Antioch. So he starts making his way back to Antioch. Antioch and he makes a stop in the city of Ephesus. And it's a short stop. He's only there for maybe about a week, maybe two weeks or so, just real brief, um, kind of almost kind of like an exploratory thing. Almost like he's just stopping off there to kind of recharge, to get to, to resupply his outfit, and to kind of get a sense of where might God be calling him to go to next. And so he's there real briefly, and then he takes off and he eventually makes his way all the way back to Antioch. And he, sit, and he spends, and that's, that's actually considered to be the end of his second missionary journey. Shortly after he sets out from Antioch again, this time on his third missionary journey, he decides to make his first stop or first major stop back at the city of Ephesus. Maybe there's some unfinished business. Maybe something came up. Maybe he liked what he saw in terms of the potential for, for church growth there. It's kind of something that church planters do from time to time. We, we kind of assess areas and decide, okay, can we actually make something happen? But he decides to actually make his first major stop on his third missionary journey, the city of Ephesus. And he spends three years in Ephesus, the longest that he spends any time during, any, during the entire course of his missionary career. He spends three years in the city of Ephesus. Before we go too further, before we dig into our text, let's go ahead and take a minute to pray for God's leading during our time of study here this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts, open our ears, open our minds, Lord, that we would be challenged, that we would be encouraged by your word this morning, Lord. We pray that you would open it up and that you would let it infect us. And let it transform us. That, that what we hear this morning, that the gospel would take root in us perhaps in a new way. And that what we hear this morning would motivate us and challenge us and equip us and empower us to go out and proclaim your name boldly. 
We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, F, uh, Acts chapter 19 is where we're going this morning. Acts chapter 19. We're going to begin reading at verse 1. While Paulos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, What then, or then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But, sometime, but some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs who, and aprons who had, that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, In the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. And one day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. Achaia, something like that. See, even I have hard times with some of these biblical names. After I had been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. So in Athens, if Athens in many ways was sort of like, you know, with its emphasis on academics and philosophy, which I pointed out and we looked at last week and saw last week, was the Berkeley in many ways of the Roman Empire, Ephesus can in many ways be thought of as something more like Detroit or Columbus, Ohio. Yeah, I know. Some of you have been to Detroit, some of you have been to Columbus, you kind of get what I'm talking about, but it's not necessarily in terms of the economic spectrum that I'm thinking about. The economic difference is, it's more in that Athens was the center of Greek culture and worship, while Ephesus was a working class city where people in many ways were simply trying to pay their bills and survive. There's a major difference. Ephesus, officially Ephesus, was founded as an industrial colony of Athens. It was intended to, to kind of cash in as a way of the, the, the Athenians cashing in on trade to Asia and the mining that took place in the area. But realistically, we don't know when Ephesus was first settled. What we do know is that archaeological evidence relating to the area suggests that people were living there long before the Athenians colonized the area of Ephesus. In the first century, it boasted a well-protected inland harbor and a population of, get this, 250,000 residents. It was the second largest city in the Roman Empire behind only Rome itself. The wealthiest residents of Ephesus had indoor plumbing and heat to keep them warm during the winter. Something that we don't often think about even was even around at that time, 2,000 years ago. And so although it was a solid middle class working city or middle working class city, they enjoyed some of the most technologically advanced luxuries that the day could afford and the day had. Ephesus was the location of one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the great temple of Artemis. It was four times the size of the Parthenon in Athens where Paul had recently been. 
It stood until the 4th century when it was torn down by the early church father, by an early church father by the name of John Chrysostom, who was at that point the bishop of that area of the Roman Empire. Artemis Ephesia, the name, the official name of the goddess, despite what you may have heard and despite what we often think was not the Greek goddess Artemis that we so often think about. Actually, Artemis Ephesia was more of a hybrid between the Greek Artemis and a local deity that was around even before the Athenians arrived by the name of Sibele. Sibe, uh, she was often symbolized, Artemis Ephesia was often symbolized by a bee, which was in many ways kind of a homage to the agriculture that took place and still does take place around, around Ephesus. It, she was a goddess and she was often attributed with fertility and military strength. Much like a bee being responsible for pollination as well as also having the ability to sting. That's where Artemis Ephesia got her, her identity from. And so the Ephesians and the entire city of Ephesus was dedicated to Artemis Ephesia. Because of the lowbrow nature of the Ephesians, Paul's ministry in Ephesia looked very different from his ministry in Athens. Acts 19 has a very different tone and different feel compared to Acts 17. And our text has all the great markings, the great, all the markings of a great, get this, a great cosmological battle that takes place between the God of the Bible and Artemis. We don't often see that. We don't often realize that when we look at this story. We think, well, Paul is just going around. He's just doing what Paul does. He's preaching the gospel. He's talking about the kingdom of God. But when we start to dig in, we start to realize kind of what's going on and the culture that's going on here. What we see here is this enormous battle of strength that is taking place between God and Artemis. It's almost like Paul walked into Ephesians. He said, my God can beat up your God. And when we look at our text, it's exactly what happens. We see sign after sign of exactly that thing happening. So we're going to jump around a little bit. So if you still have your Bibles open, I encourage you to leave them open. Or if you don't, you're probably going to want to have them open so you don't kind of get lost and confused about where we're going and what's going on here. Let's go back to verse 1 here a second again. While Paulos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, No, we have, not, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, "When Then what baptism did you receive? And John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied, and there were about 12 men in all. There's a few things, a few difficulties and challenges, a few questions that come up in these first seven verses that I want to address. And I know that's not a popular thing to do, and usually even in seminary classes, not recommended that you pop holes in your own text. But to be fair, if you were to open really any commentary on this text, they're going to point out the difficulties and the challenges that arise in these first seven verses. One of them, the first thing that I really want to acknowledge here, first thing I want to acknowledge here is really comes in verses one and two already. So Paul arrives in Ephesus and he finds these disciples. And disciples is a word that we're all pretty familiar with and we automatically equate to being somebody who believes in Jesus, somebody who's saved. But something about them, something about Paul's interactions with them forces him or causes him to ask the question, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Right off the bat, that's kind of a funny question. We think, well, a disciple, you know, disciples, they, they know the Holy Spirit. They know God. They know Jesus. They understand this whole Trinity thing. They've, they've heard about the Holy Spirit. So why is Paul even asking this question? It's a weird question for him to ask. The second thing that I want to acknowledge, the second kind of confusing piece about this that I want to acknowledge is that they say no. These disciples say no. They didn't even know that there was a Holy Spirit. They hadn't even heard of the Holy Spirit. And when Paul pushes them and finds out that they had been baptized by John the Baptist, or actually by, probably by one of John's own followers and disciples, because John didn't make his way all the way to Ephesus, when they found out that they had received John's baptism, that left them, or that makes us even more confused because John talked about the Holy Spirit. John's disciples, John's followers would have known full well who the Holy Spirit was. They understood that. And so why then did these disciples in Ephesus, how is it that they, did not, they didn't even know the Holy Spirit even existed? It's another one of those problem pieces for us. It's another one of those confusing things. And we get the sense that there's a lot of details here, these conversations that were just left out. And then, and then there's this third piece here. 
a second. This third piece down in verse, uh, verse 6. When, when, when Paul baptizes them, he, he talks about Jesus, he, he shares Jesus with them, and he baptizes them in the name of Jesus so that they're so shown to be coming to faith. And when Paul does that, he lays his hands on them, and these disciples, they begin to speak in tongues and prophesy. And we've seen this a number of times now in the book of Acts, is the, the Holy Spirit coming on people at the point of faith and, and beginning to speak in tongues and praise God in tongues and prophesy. And, and it almost kind of makes you start to wonder, is this the way it's supposed to go? I mean, some of our brothers and sisters, you know, actually go to that extent and say, well, you know, you're not really a believer. You're not, you haven't really been saved if you don't speak in tongues and if you don't prophesy. My guess is, I'm just kind of going out on a limb, but I'm pretty confident in this, probably nobody here has ever spoken in tongues or prophesied. And so that, you know, if you take this really, really literally and you start looking at this history of bad acts and what we've seen come up over and over and over again with this, it's easy for us to start to doubt, well, am I really saved? Are you really saved? I've never spoken in tongues. I've never prophesied. How do I know that I'm really saved? This is actually the one out of those three points. This is the only one that I really have a, a halfway decent answer for, to be honest. And it's that Luke tends to say stuff like this, speaking in tongues and prophesying, sort of as a way of emphasizing the fact that the believers have received the Holy Spirit. It's almost like a transitional statement, almost kind of like a clip art type thing that, that Luke just kind of inserts. And it's not that this didn't actually happen, but Luke uses it as, dev as a device to emphasize and show that these people, these di disciples in Ephesus, they really are believers. They really have received the Holy Spirit. They really have been equipped and called to a certain ministry. And so when you look at these first seven verses, the push here is not so much on the details. I would say the push is not so much on the details here. It's more on the fact that what's being emphasized is faith in Jesus as opposed to Artemis and the role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is showing up once again. And when the Holy Spirit shows up, big stuff happens. Dangerous stuff happens. Stuff that rocks the world. Stuff that changes entire cities and changes entire communities. When the Holy Spirit shows up, you know this is going to get good. And in many ways, that's what we're seeing in these first seven verses here. It's at this point, going on from verse 8 and on, that the dialogue almost completely disappears. And now we have is just a narrative. We just have Luke telling a story and giving an account of what is happening. But it's all in this framework of faith in Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit in terms of where it starts. Okay, I want to pause. I want to go, I want to jump over to verse 20 a second. We're going to take a look at verse 20 and then we'll go back and cover everything in the middle. So verse 20. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. And take a look at this word power. We've been talking a lot throughout the book of Acts. We've been talking a lot about the fact that Luke ordinarily uses the Greek word dunamis. And we've talked about that a few times now. By this point, you should be at least you know, familiar enough and say, hey, you know, I remember Jason saying something about that. So this word dunamis, which we've seen a lot has come up, points to, it's sometimes and often translated as power, but what it really points to is this power and authority that comes from the Holy Spirit. But Luke doesn't use the word dunamis here. When he talks about power in verse 20, it's not dunamis that is in view. The word that Luke uses is the Greek word kratos. So when you look at our title up there, God's kratos, you wonder what in the world is kratos? Well, here's kratos. Kratos is more this idea, not necessarily the spiritual authority that comes from the Holy Spirit. It's more the idea of physical strength. In many ways, you know, it, it, this is, you know, ordinarily what we see happening is God or Paul or some of the, one of the apostles or somebody going out. And I've said before, you know, it's not that they went out and started going to CrossFit or going to, going to the gym and, and got buff. It's more of a different kind of a power and authority. Well, here it is all about God in a sense or Paul in a sense going to CrossFit and going to the gym and getting buff. It's about muscle. It's about physical strength that we have going on here. But the word kratos is a word that's not used for people ordinarily. It's only used for God in the New Testament. So we are actually talking about God's muscle. God is actually coming into Ephesus through the Holy Spirit, through Paul, through these disciples, and he's actually flexing some muscle. I hope you're starting to see the full picture here because we talked about Ephesus and I kind of outlined Ephesus. Ephesus is a very large and very powerful city dedicated to a hybrid goddess that is all about expansion, fertility, and military strength, physical strength. 
And Luke says, in this way, referring back to all the stuff that we skipped over, but we'll go back. In this way, through all these amazing acts that are contained here in Acts 19, through all the amazing acts, in this way, the word of the Lord revealed its kratos, its physical strength. God is going to battle with Artemis Ephesia. And he is doing it publicly. He's going to battle through the Holy Spirit, through Paul. God is flexing his muscle in a way that caused the residents of the city in the last half of chapter 19 to riot because they didn't like what they were seeing. They didn't like the fact that their patron goddess was being shown up and being revealed as weak. All right, verse 8. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. So Paul goes, he arrives in Ephesus, and he goes and he does what God has, what Paul has a tendency to go and do. He goes into the synagogues and he starts preaching about Jesus and they get ticked off at him and so they kick him out. They kick him out and he's got to find a new place to go. So he heads over and he finds this place called, that, we, that, that, that Luke calls the lecture hall of Tyrannus. We have no idea who Tyrannus was. We have no idea how it is that Paul knew him or met him or if Paul even did know him. We have no idea what he did. We don't even know why it is that this guy Tyrannus even agreed to let Paul use his lecture hall for two whole years. These lecture halls, this was sort of like seen as the property of these intellectuals, the property of these scholars or these philosophers. To give up your lecture hall was to sit here and say that this person over here, Paul, for example, has better knowledge and has more wisdom and has a better way of looking at life than what Tyrannus had. And Paul got free use of this lecture hall for two whole years. For two, two whole years. This is different from what we see happen in other places in the book of Acts. See, ordinarily when Paul goes to a city and he starts a church, he starts these little home groups, these cell groups, these house churches that are spread throughout the city. And every now and then they get together, they work together on maybe a big project or something along those lines, some way of really pushing out into the community. But here in Ephesus, we don't see small groups, we don't see house churches. We see the church starting as a big, large-scale public gathering in a public place. The church ordinarily starts in secret in the book of Acts. In Ephesus, it started publicly, without shame, without fear, in a place where everybody could see and know what was going on. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and, and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were, cur were, were cured, and the evil spirits left them. God was so powerfully at work in Paul that all people had to do was rub him, was rub their handkerchief or the apron on him and take it to someone on the other side of town who was sick or had an evil spirit of some sort and they would be healed. In many ways, it's almost kind of like looking at the beginnings of, of this whole system of sacred relics that really kind of dominates, in many ways, dominates the Catholic Church. It's, it's almost like going to Rome, for those of you who may have been there, or at least maybe even those of you who at least heard of it, going to Rome, going down into the basement at the Vatican and rubbing St. Peter's foot in the hopes of getting a thousand years off purgatory, except this actually worked. People actually would take their handkerchiefs, take their aprons, whatever they could, touch Paul just ever so slightly. And the power of the Holy Spirit, God was working through him so powerfully that all they had to do was take those back to their loved ones or their friends and touch them with these things and their friends would be healed. They'd be cured. You can't miss that. Verse 13. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the, name of the, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. And actually, I think this is one of the funniest scenes in the whole Bible right here. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish high priest, were doing this. And one day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating 
They ran out of the house naked and bleeding. One man taking on seven. One man taking on seven. And these weren't, you know, seven, you know, just kind of small, weak men. I mean, you got to think about the day. We're talking about physical labor. We're talking about physical strength. These men might have been served in the, in the local synagogue in some way. But they were still had, they still had day jobs. They were still lifting things. They were still strong men. And here's one man who takes on these seven and sends them out of the house running, afraid, bleeding, beat up, naked. This is perhaps the section in our text where the focus on physical strength is the most evident. People began to realize that the power of the Holy Spirit and the strength that Jesus had, com- the strength that of Jesus as compared to no Jesus or as a, compared to Artemis, and, and certain people began trying to, to take on and, and, and invoking the name of Paul and Jesus, like these seven sons. And they started going around and trying to cast out these demons. And when we see this scene here, what we see happen, and what we actually, actually, what we, what we do know, again, from archaeology, is that Luke calls, calls this, this man Sceva, he calls him a Jewish high priest. In Ephesus, we don't have any record of a high priest that was ever named Sceva. In Ephesus, what we're probably talking about here is something more like a Jewish cult in many ways, something more like a hybrid between Judaism and, and Artemis temple worship here. And so what these seven sons were likely doing, they were likely in some ways trying to influence or trying to kind of run Jesus through the lens of Artemis. In some ways, there were probably a lot of people who thought that Paul was going around and this Jesus person was was just really kind of just kind of a new way of worshiping Artemis and serving Artemis. And so they go around and they're trying to, they try to invoke Paul's name, they try to invoke Jesus' name. And what God ends up doing, he ends up taking the situation to show who really has the power. God uses a demoniac of all people to defeat Artemis. And you might think, you know, a demoniac spiritually, we're talking about weakness here. I mean, compared to God, a demoniac can't beat God. And here's God using what in his realm would be the weakest of the weak. And he uses the weakest of the weak to beat Artemis, to beat up on Artemis, to flex his muscle over Artemis. And all the while, the demoniac openly admits that Jesus and Paul have power over him, but no one else. Jesus, I know. Paul, I've heard of. But I have no idea who you are. Get out of here. God flexes his muscle and goes to battle with Artemis. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, that they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls, scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. For those of you who may be wondering, 50,000 drachmas, one drachma was equal to about one day's wages. And so 50,000 drachmas, I actually did the math on this, is equal to about roughly $8.2 million in today's U.S. currency. That's a lot of money and a lot of books that got burned. And they did this not privately. They didn't do this in secret. They didn't throw them in their fireplace inside their home where nobody could see what they were burning. They did it publicly. And we look at these three verses in 17 to 20 and where all of this is culminating at, where a text is coming to a climax. It's that public nature that I really want to emphasize here and point out here. When people started to see what God was doing, when people started to recognize just how much more strong, just how much stronger God was, when they started to see his kratos, they began to realize that this God, we thought Artemis was strong, but this God, the God of Paul, Jesus, is far stronger than Artemis. And they began to come and openly and publicly confess what they had done, publicly confess maybe their sins, but also publicly confess their faith. And a number of those who practiced sorcery brought their skulls and burned them publicly in the town square where people could see them and people could see who was putting these scrolls on the fire. The gospel, the kingdom of God, the, the, the gospel of Jesus was public. And the people in Ephesus, the believers in Ephesus, they didn't hide it. They didn't hide what was going on. Seven men are not going to be beat up by a single demoniac without drawing considerable attention. 
a handkerchief that, ball, that Paul blows his nose with and then goes and, and then gets to use to cure a paralytic, that's not going to go unnoticed. People will talk about that. And just like these 12 men, 12 men are not going to be beat up by a single man and run away naked and afraid without drawing or without getting in the, the local newspapers. The dunamis of God that spiritual authority and power that we all possess from the Holy Spirit comes out when we boldly and verbally proclaim the glory of God and the Lordship of Jesus. But the kratos of God is displayed when we openly confess what we have done, when we turn our head knowledge and our internal faith into external action and we begin to live it the way God has empowered us to live it. We live in a culture where every day we are bombarded by advertisements. Every time we turn on the radio or the TV, there's a voice telling us that this product or that event that might be coming up is going to change your life. Advertising and marketing is a a billion-dollar-a-year industry full of empty promises and false hopes. We're surrounded by people who will stand in line for days just to get their hands on this, a phone. I thought about doing it, but I didn't. I didn't have the money. Michelle would have been mad at me. (laughs) Sorry. We are surrounded. Black Friday, Black Friday news reports, you turn on the TV. The TV, you go online, you open up the newspaper. Black Friday news reports are filled with people who believe so strongly that a Furby is going to provide fulfillment to their children that they resort to violence just to get their hands on one. And I'm wondering, why don't you just sit down and play a game with your kids? (laughs) This week is Halloween. And unless you happen to live in kind of a weird neighborhood where nobody goes trick-or-treating like I do, people are going to be knocking on your door. Halloween, for all the different opinions and ideas and things like that that we might have, and all the different attitudes and, and ways of approaching and ways of thinking about it that, that might be here, that we might have heard or been exposed to or might have wrestled with at some point in the past, Halloween is actually the one day, the one day out of the year where your neighbors actually want to talk to you. I mean, how many of your neighbors actually use their front door? Most, my experience, most of our neighbors, they come home, they pull into their, their garage, they close their garage door, and they go inside. And when they leave the house, they do the same thing. They go out their garage, into their car, open up the garage door, they pull away. You never see them, you never talk to them. But on Halloween, they actually, neighbors actually want to talk to each other. People are actually coming and willingly knocking on your door. And perhaps, yeah, maybe the candy has something to do with it, but... People actually want to talk to their neighbors. Halloween is the one day out of the year that you get an opportunity to meet a neighbor for the first time or meet somebody new for the first time. Not because, as I've talked so much about going out into the world and finding opportunities and doing this and getting involved in this, it's because people are actually coming to you. As believers, we don't have to work hard on Halloween. People come to us. Perhaps maybe for Halloween this year, you know, you don't need necessarily to hand out tracts or or to quote Bible verses or share Bible passages. I mean, you can do that if you want to, but that's not necessarily what you need to do. Perhaps simply, you know, fulfilling and following through and carrying out and revealing, having an opportunity to reveal God's dunamis and God's kratos. Perhaps it might be as simple as simply Make a comment about a costume or the costumes of the kids standing in front of you. Take a moment to meet the parents. Take a moment to get to know who your neighbors are and to find out where they live and if the bug bites, maybe even invite them over for dinner for a night or organize a play date. Just simply do things that share life together. It's through those sorts of interactions that the dunamis and the kratos, the power and the strength of God, is revealed. It's through just those everyday interactions. When Paul was living in Ephesus, when he was ministering in Ephesus, he was not there as a vocational minister. Paul, during the three years that he was in Ephesus, was a tent maker. The gospel spread because Paul was simply 
talking about it and living it and doing things in the course of everyday life. It was in the course of his living and his working among the people of Ephesus. It's in the course of your living and working among your neighbors and your co-workers that the gospel takes root and that the gospel did take root in Ephesus. The world, the world without a doubt has a hunger It has a hunger to be satisfied. It has a hunger that realistically can only be satisfied by the gospel of Jesus. And we, you, me, we have all been appointed, we've all been called spiritually by God to live in such a way that publicly exemplifies the kratos of the gospel. It's in that way, by living and being among and within and interacting with the people around us. It's in that way that the word of the Lord spreads widely and wildly like a virus throughout the world, throughout our communities. It's in that way that people start to realize their need. It's in that way that people start to realize just how good the news is of the gospel of Jesus. Jesus.